The topic of the mark of the beast is not only the most controversial, but the most popular Bible topic today. And rightly so, because the issue of the mark of the beast will be one that helps to divide the world in these last days and will determine the final destiny for many. And so it's a very important topic. But as I do the research on the internet, I realize that there is a lot of misunderstanding about what the mark of the beast is. And so in this Bible study, or this presentation that I'm about to show you, I give you six key points that are practical and biblical that you can use to judge and to determine what the mark of the beast is. I try not to give you cut and dry answer just to tell you what the mark of the beast is, but to give you points, things that you can think about and think logically to understand what the mark of the beast is. This presentation was done during the Bible Prophecy Update series at the Sydenham SDA Church. I was going to redo the presentation, but when I listened to it, I realized that it was well covered. And so stay tuned. If this is your first time watching this channel, please consider subscribing and click the notification I consider that you can get more update. Our goal on this channel is to help you spiritually and to help you understand the Bible better so you can grow more in Christ. Stay tuned. Decoding the mark of the beast. As I said before, my intention this evening is not just to tell you what the mark of the beast is, but to take you on a journey to understanding what the mark of the beast is. As we said last evening, that Bible prophecy is a spiritual exercise and only those who, only the wise, the book of Daniel says, will understand. And so we have to pay close attention and it takes comparing scripture with scripture as we said last evening. If you haven't watched the other presentation, please go back and watch it. Um, it's titled Unlocking Bible Prophecy. So I'm going to talk about a few points about understanding what the mark of the beast is the first point or the first step is to understand who the beast is you know I, I find it very interesting i find it very interesting that a lot of discussion is taking place about the mark of the beast and no one almost no one is asking who is the beast in terms of the discussion i hear about vaccine i heard about a chip in your hand but who is the beast that should have been the first logical question to ask. And that's the first one. Now, this question, trying to answer, answer this question, will take us through a long history of Bible prophecy. And it takes me about, it takes me a couple of weeks to teach this lesson to, to my students. So to do it in one night um, is a challenge, but I'll, I'll, I'll do enough to get you to understand. All right, so understanding who the beast is will take us through a review of Bible prophecy, especially the prophecy of Daniel and the chapter 13 of Revelation. Because the beast of Revelation 13 is understood to be pulling on the language of Daniel chapter 7. And so we need to go to Daniel chapter 7 and even some of Daniel chapter 2 to look at the kingdom. So I'm going to go to the screen now. And on the screen, you'll see a summary of Daniel's chapter 2 and 7. But you'll also see the kingdoms and the dates that they rule. And so you see here that the head of gold, the head of gold represents Babylon in Daniel chapter 2. As well as in Daniel chapter 7, the lion represents the same kingdom. Then you have the beer and the chest and arms of silver representing Medo Persia, who ruled from 539 to 331 BC. Then the ties of brass and the leopard with four wings and four heads represent the kingdom of Greece. And then the legs of iron and the fourth beast represents Rome. Rome. Hold it on the screen there a little, a little time there for me. Okay? Now, what we're seeing here is that when we get to Revelation 13, you're going to find that this beast 
is pulling on the language of Daniel chapter 7. Okay? Let's go to the um, next slide. And again, I'm sorry that I have to be summarizing because of the time factor and what I have to cover. But please take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13 and read verses 1 to 3, and you can catch up. As well as Daniel chapter 7, verses 21 to 25. And that will give you a summary of the little horn and the, the beast of Revelation 13. What we're saying is that both entities, both icons, represent the same power. Okay? And this power is part of Rome. I'm, I'm going to touch on, on that a little more, but a different type of Rome, different phase of the Roman Empire. So both powers, Revelation 13 and, 7, and Daniel 7, came up out of the sea. Both the little horn and this beast of Revelation 13, um, they reflect, the, the, the beast of Revelation 13 is a composite of all the beasts of Daniel chapter 7. The, bee, the little horn of Daniel 7 speak great words against the Most High, and the beast of Revelation 13 blasphemes the Most High or speak blasphemous words. And then in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn reigns for a time, times, and a half a time, and the beast of Revelation 13 reigns for 42 months. And if you do the calculation, you're going to realize it's the same time, both the time, times, and a half a time, representing three and a half years. In Bible prophecy, it's the same amount of time as 42 months. I don't have time to explain that now, maybe another time, but just take my word for it as it is now and do some research. Same as 1260 years. All right? You can take off this, this, this screen now. So what we're saying is that this beast, of Revelation 13 verses 1 and 2, well, well, for the entire chapter, is a continuation of the kingdoms or runs parallel with the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. You also see this, that the beast of Revelation 13 is, follows the dragon of Revelation 12. And in Bible prophecy, even though the dragon represents Satan, the dragon also represents Rome, who was trying to kill the man-child. And this beast power is going to take its authority from the dragon. According to Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2, I should think I should have it on the screen. The Bible says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So let me pause here to say what, I, what I'm trying to say here. If you interpret Bible prophecy using the historicist method, you can remove the screen. If you use the historicist method, as I discussed with you last evening, God presents the kingdoms of the world in sequence, okay? So, for example, in Daniel chapter 7, you have Medo-Persia following Babylon, Greece following Medo-Persia, Rome following um, Greece. And then the Bible tells us that Rome itself will be broken up into several kingdoms and will have different phases of rulership. And Revelation 12 shows us that the beast power that we're talking about and concerned about follows the dragon because the dragon hands over power to the beast. Okay? It's just the same way in Daniel chapter 7 that the little horn comes out of the Roman Empire, the, that final beast. And also in Daniel chapter um, 2, the kingdom is divided into iron and clay so right up front this beast of revelation 13 is identified as papal rome okay that took over rulership of the world after 
pagan Rome fell, so to speak, because what happened, the pagan Roman Empire was, was not conquered by another empire as such. It was divided up into different um, kingdoms, as, as mentioned, it has 10 horns, by the Germanic tribes that came from the, from the north. Rome was vandalized and was, and was divided up. But eventually, through a series of successive events, the bishop of Rome became so prominent that con AD and would rule the world for several years. What I'm saying here, the conclusion I'm making is a well-known fact of history. I'm not making this up. When you study the, 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 the conclusions, especially when you go back to Protestant America, the most prominent theologians in America from any denomination, from the, from the Baptists, the Methodists, the Anglicans, the Puritans, the Congregationalists, the Calvinists, they all conclude that the beast of Revelation chapter 13 represents the papacy. So it's not only Seventh Adventists who is picking on Catholic. Do your studies, do your research, and you will see that this is a reality. You can keep the screen off um, for me, Jane. Do your research and you'll see that this is a conclusion, starting from Martin Luther um, coming right up. But you'll notice, as I said last evening, whenever God's people forsake this, the use of the historicist method in doing Bible prophecy, we go into apostasy and we end up into a problem and there's confusion about who the beast is and so on. So in, in history, there was no confusion about who the beast is. They knew, especially those those theologians and, and Christians who were fleeing from the persecuting power from Europe, coming to America, they knew exactly who the beast was. The only difference with their interpretation is that they, they did not see two beasts in the Revelation 13. They saw one. And they are not very far off. I would not say that they are incorrect because we're, we're, we're going to come to that. So the first point to establish in trying to Look at what the mark of the beast is, is to identify the beast. And we this evening, based upon Bible prophecy and based upon the historicist method, we are identifying papal Rome as the beast that inherited its power from the Roman Empire. Okay? The second point that we want to look at is that the second beast of Revelation 30 needs also to be identified. The reason we need to identify the second beast, it is because this beast does, sev does several things, sorry. This second beast really is the one responsible for setting up the image to the beast, for implementing the mark of the beast, and causing all the world to receive the, the, work and the mark of the beast and to worship the beast. Okay? This second beast, you can go to the next slide for me. This second beast will do these things. It will set up an image to the beast, implement the mark of the beast, cause the world to, work, to, to receive a mark and to worship the beast. It will even call fire down from heaven to deceive the world and cause them to set up an image to the beast. So we have to identify the second beast because he plays a very key role in the implementation of the mark of the beast. All right, so who is the second beast? Let's go to the next slide. This second beast comes up after the first beast receives a deadly wound. The Bible tells us that the first beast that I, might, that I identified as the papacy received a deadly wound. When did, when did the first beast receive a deadly wound? The first beast received a deadly wound in 1798 when the Pope was taken captive by Napoleon's general um, birth year. But of course, by that time, even though the Pope was taken captive by, at that time, but before that, the papacy was losing a lot of power. Starting from the Reformation of, in the 1500s and, 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 and the, the, the discovery and the, the, the migration to North America, the papacy was losing a lot of influence and they had to try several things, the counter-reformation and stuff 
to try and overcome that. But it was too late. The, the land of America that was discovered had provided a haven for freedom. It had provided a haven to, to rebirth a religion that is not based upon the rulership of a king. And so by that time, the papacy had lost a lot of power. And today, if you go to Wikipedia or any other place, you'll find that the papacy has lost most of its power in terms of political power. Okay? So this second beast, the Bible tells us, comes up after the first beast receives its deadly wound. It comes up out of the earth and it has two horns like a lamb but speak as a dragon. And when you study Bible, when you study history, you find that there is only one power that came up just in time when the, when the papacy was receiving that, that deadly wound. The, the, the United States of America is the power that came up during that time. And so this second beast is identified as the United States of America or Protestant America. This is the power because, you know, the, the, the rightly said, according to Revelation chapter 12, the earth helped the woman when the beast tried to put, um, to, to overcome her with a flood. The story of that um, situation is that the, 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 the Protestant Reformation was making strides in Europe. But when, it, when, when after Martin Luther died and some of these pioneers of the, of the Reformation died, the Catholic power almost gained back its, its power in Europe, even in, in England where the Anglican Church had broken away from Rome. But you had a group of people called the separatists or the Puritans who were fighting for freedom of religion, fighting for reformation within the Anglican church. But they were facing difficulty. They, at one point, they had to take refuge in, in, um, in Holland, but they couldn't find refuge. But when, when America was discovered, they took their trip um, to America in about between 1630s and 1640s. And that was the beginning of the establishment of Protestant America in the 1600s to the point where America gained independence in the 1770s. And when America became independent, the Catholic were so in the minority that they went to the president of the United States, the first president, and asked him, will we have freedom in this country too? And the president said, no problem. You will be free here. All, all religion are welcome. All people are welcome to practice their religion freely. So America is that power that represents the second beast. Okay? The problem is that this power is not only a political power again. It is going to create an image to the beast. And we're going to get into that in a little while. The third point that I wanted to focus on. Remember now, we are, we are talking about how we're going to understand what the mark of the beast is and we're currently in the phase of identifying the beast the two beasts the first beast and the second beast right the third thing to understand is that rome is the final kingdom on the earth i want you to pay close attention to that even though you have the rise of the papacy and you have america coming up Based on Bible prophecy, both Daniel, chapter, Daniel and Revelation, we see that Rome is the final kingdom. Let me give you, let me, let me illustrate. If you go to Daniel chapter 2, if you put that, that screen up for me, please. Um, yes. Daniel chapter 2 shows us that the final kingdom is the feet of iron and clay. That is a kingdom that the stone that is cut out without hands will hit and destroy and become a great mountain. Rev Daniel chapter 7 is telling us that the that ugly beast, 
with 10 horns and then a little horn comes up that is the final kingdom on earth and Daniel chapter 8 tells us that the little horn is the final kingdom that will be destroyed without hands what am I saying here the point I'm trying to make is that at the end of the day, even though America was raised up as a nation to, be, to, to, to host Protestantism, at the end of the day, Bible prophecy is telling us that Rome will be the final kingdom on earth. How will that play out? Let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and 17. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17 first. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 17 is telling us that the power that will eventually be the last power that will be destroyed, the Babylon the Great, Mr. Babylon the Great, that will, be, that will fall. Here is how the angel described this power. It says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottom of the spit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So hold it here now. So what the Bible is telling us that this beast power that was and is not, that means right now when <laughs> wherever John was in the prophecy is not, meaning that he has lost his power for a while yet is it will come back it will return because it will be the last kingdom upon the earth let's go to verse 14 of revelation 13 yes the same point is made, made here the bible says and deceive it them this is this is speaking to what the second beast will do and deceive it them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So this beast's power of Revelation 13, it will receive a wound as if it's going to die, but it will live. And some theologians will tell you, even though I can't go too deep into this, some theologians will tell you that this second beast is mimicking the Son of God. Because the, the, it's a threefold beast. You, know, you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The three, it's three powers that's fighting against God's people in the last days, representing the, the Trinity or conflicting with the Trinity. The, the, the dragon represents a father who gives authority to his son. The beast representing the Son of God because guess what? Who is it that died and resurrected? <laughs> Jesus. Who is it that lived and worked for three and a half years? Jesus. And this beast reigned for, for a time, times and a half. So it is mimicking the Son of God. That it will receive a deadly wound, but it's going to live again. It's going to resurrect. So we are looking for Rome to be the final power on earth. Maybe in a different form, but it's the same rule. The principles that, that reigned during the time of papacy, that same power will reign at the end of the day. And some people may question how this is possible because America is built upon the firm principle of separation of church and state. In, in Amendment Number 1, it, said, it tells us that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. We are seeing that America will establish upon a principle of separation of church and state because Rome was established on, on the unity of church and state. Even the Church of England was established on those principles but America destroyed that but Bible prophecy is telling us that all of America's good principles will be reversed because this second beast 
will make an image to the first beast. And an image represents the idea of the unity of church and state. So what it's saying basically is that Protestant America will forsake its protest and will once again be reunited, not only reunited with Rome, but will also unite with state. Did you know that the Catholics, as I said, were the minorities when, when the constitution was written? But by the late 1800s, Roman Catholics were the largest denomination in America. Okay, so you're going to look out for that. Point number four. Point number four is that in trying to identify the mark of the beast, we must recognize that the mark of the beast is opposite to the seal of God. Okay? So in the last days, you will either be marked in your right or in your forehead based upon your allegiance to the beast, or you will be sealed with the seal of the living God. It, it, there is no middle ground. Let's look, sorry, at the screen. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. Verse 3. The Bible says that John said, He saw an angel um, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have seen the servants of our God in their foreheads. So right where God wants to put his seal, Satan wants to put his mark. Let me repeat that. Right where God want, wants to put his seal, Satan wants to put his mark in your forehead or in your hands. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible gives us a hint as to what the seal of, the God, uh, of God is. It says, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay? So what it is saying to me is that the seal of God represents the idea that we are so low to God. Because if you read Revelation 14, I don't have it on the screen, but Revelation 14 verses 1 to 4, after the, after the mark, of the, amidst the implementation of the mark of the beast, you're going to find a set of people who have gotten the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark. And they are standing on Mount Zion with the name of God written in their foreheads. So the point I'm trying to make is that there will be a people on earth and the Bible says that they follow the lamb wherever he's go, he goes. And there is no fault in their mouth. They are without fault before the throne of God. So those who receive the seal of God are those who are sold out to God already. <laughs> they can't sell out to Babylon because they are sold out to God. That's what it comes down to. And we understand that the name of God being written in their foreheads represents the character of God. Are we together? It represents the character of God. Just as though um, Jesus tells us to baptize. When you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Meaning that you're, you have no take on their credential. You, are, you have no take on their character and their likeness. And what is it that represents God's character? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. The Bible says, For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me emphasize the point here. 
So, so the seal of God represents the name of God written in your foreheads. And the idea of writing the name of God in your foreheads is equivalent to the idea of God writing his law in their hearts to demonstrate that these are his people. So while you have a, 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 a people on earth who are wandering after the beast, who are faithful to the beast, you're going to have a people of God who possess God's character and are following the lamb wherever he goes by in obedience to his commandments. And I'll point out in a little while how I came to that conclusion. So the, the character of God is reflected in the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments. And guess what? Guess what? The writing of God's name in our foreheads, therefore, is not a literal seal. It's not a mark that you can see. Just like how, um, when God asks the Israelites to, to write the law of God on the doorpost and on their whatever it is, it wasn't so that merely that they could have a physical writing. No, it was the obedience that God was focusing on. So here is a people who the Holy Spirit would have written the law in their hearts. And they are so much in harmony with him that they are marked, they are sealed according to heaven. The, the, the people on earth will not see a literal and physical seal but the evidence will be in their behavior. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, that the, the seal of their commitment will be not only their obedience to the Ten Commandments, but their obedience to the Sabbath, the Fourth Commandment, because it will be a special point of controversy in the last days. And I'll come back to that in a little while. But the point I'm trying to make in this point number four is that the mark of the beast is not a literal mark. Okay? It's not a literal mark. So let's go to point number five. Point number five in trying to decipher and to decode the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast must therefore be a moral issue. Okay? The mark of the beast must be a moral issue. <laughs> and I can't emphasize that more because every time I go on social media, my heart pains me for seeing how some of us interpret mark of the beast and we get confused. The mark of the beast, therefore, cannot be the vaccine or, the, or, the, or a chip because that's not a moral issue. And some people even go as far as saying that they're going to put something in the vaccine so it's going to change your DNA and change how you do. Let's go back, let's go back to Daniel chapter 3. It's not on the screen. Just hold the screen there. When you go back in your mind to Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6, you will see... And, and by the way, Daniel chapter 3, it, it, Daniel, Revelation 13 is pulling the language of Daniel chapter 3 almost word for word in terms of the concepts. Because here it is, we have Babylon, last day Babylon, who is setting up an image and calling all the world to bow down to that image. The reason why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up it is because the, the bowing down to that image is a moral issue. They would have been disobeying the second commandment, the first and second commandment that says you must not have any other God before me. The same thing in Daniel chapter 6. When they set up a law to say Daniel must not worship any other God for 30 days. It was a moral issue because Daniel would have been disobeying the first commandment. If you notice, brothers and sisters, that in, while in Babylon, Daniel and his friends did not have a problem learning the language of Babylon. 
learning the signs of Babylon, being employed in the courts of Babylon, and even eating the food of Babylon. Because even though, though Daniel refused the king's food, it is still Babylonian food he have to eat because the, 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 the water and the, and the pulse he got was from Babylon. So he doesn't mind those things in Babylon. He doesn't mind learning their sciences and so on. But he would not worship the gods of Babylon because that would be disobeying God's commandments. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we must recognize that the mark of the beast must be a moral issue. I, I can't emphasize that anymore. <laughs> It's a moral issue that has to do with the Ten Commandments and disobeying God. So please, guys, let us, let us not embarrass ourselves in public by claiming that vaccination is a mark of the beast. Maybe vaccination is taken away your right. Maybe, maybe the government does, does not have the right to impose it. I do, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I can't judge that. I'm not seeing that, you know, that happening. But I'm just saying that when we reason Bible, when we reason Bible, you know, I, you know I'm, 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 I'm going off script, you know, because I, I believe that some of us who are making some of these conclusions, I believe some of us not reading the Bible. Let me, let me, let me, let me, bring, let me come to you straight. I believe that some of us are not reading the Bible. We are only re repeating what others have said, but we need to go to Revelation 13 ourselves. We think that because... Other people have studied the passage and we must study it ourselves. No, I right now, I am in Revelation. When I, when I finish preaching right here and I turn off the lights in my house and I go, I go, before I go to sleep, my Bible study will be Revelation 13 because there are still some things that I don't fully understand. So go and study for yourself, folks. Mark of the Beast is going to be a moral issue that people are going to take their stand on the side of God or on the side of the devil. Let's come on now. Issue point number six. This is the final point. Point number six. Point number six. The issue of the mark of the beast surrounds worship. It surrounds worship. It is the same issue that happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and happened with Daniel. And God is so amazing that he included the message for this time in the book of Daniel and also included the experiences of Daniel and his friends so that we can learn from that experience. As a matter of fact, Revelation is pulling on the language of Daniel chapter 3. So the issue is going to be about worship. Whether you worship the beast and receive his mark or you worship God and receive his seal, that is going to be the final issue. And so if the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, is a sign of faithfulness to God, then logically, and, and, I, and I'm saying to you, boy, the, the time... The time is not there for me to break some of these issues down. But when I tell you, please go and challenge me. Challenge me on it. Ask, post your questions in the chat, even afterwards. And we will respond to it. But listen to this. This, this Sunday sacredness becomes a sign of disobedience to God's commandments. If you study Christian history, you'll find that there is one commandment, one of the Ten Commandments, that is a problem. Some of you will tell me that is commandment number seven. <laughs> but no, it's commandment number four that most of Christianity right now is violating. Most of Christianity is living in disobedience, some ignorantly, by the way, some ignorantly, because their pastors tell them otherwise, most of Christianity is living in disobedience to the fourth commandment. 
And notice something here, how God identifies his people in this conflict with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. There are two texts I'll share with you. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in the conflict, God is giving you a hint as to the basis on which he identifies his people. He identifies his people based upon those who keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 14 also, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And that is why one of the messages, one of the final messages to the world in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7 includes a call to worship the creator. And it borrows languages from Exodus chapter 28, Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 to 11, sorry. Revelation 14 verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So while the world is calling us to worship the beast, the Bible, God's message is calling us to worship him who created heaven and earth and truly he alone deserves to be worshipped. What do you say? If you, if you agree with me, let me say here, say amen in the chat. God alone who created heaven and earth, he is the one who is worthy of worship. In Exodus chapter, chapter 20 and verse 8, the Bible tells us the basis on which the Sabbath was established. The Sabbath was established. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou art thy son, thy daughter, thy main servant, man servant, thou stranger within thy gates. Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And the commandment that God says, remember all of Christianity. Just forget about it. But, but they didn't just forget about it. Sunday is established as a day of worship because of what Rome did starting from, from 300 AD. Of course, the change was taking place um, before that. But the law, the first Sunday law was established in 325 thereabout. And since then, all of Christianity, including Protestants, have adopted Sunday as a day of worship. And with due respect to my Christian brothers and sisters, I love them dearly. I love persons from every denomination who are faithful to God based upon their knowledge. With due respect to you, history and Bible is telling us that the commandment that we have a problem with is the fourth commandment. And so this matter will be a special point of controversy in the final conflict. Because it's not it's about which day you worship on. It's more than that. It's about who has your allegiance, who has your affection, and who deserves the right to worship. Remember that Satan is seeking worship. You know, I, I, got, I just remember a question that I got from a young person based upon the sermon I preached on Sabbath morning. I, I got a question from Pastor Montague where someone was saying that she was asking about um, the, the, the Lucifer wanting to be like God. And she was asking if, if it is that Lucifer wanted to be God or to be like him in character. And I had to pull on Matthew chapter, chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians, not on the screen. But Matthew chapter 4 verse 9 tells us, that Lucifer, the devil, brought Jesus on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and says, all this will I give you if you fall down and worship me. 
So Satan has been seeking worship. Satan has been seeking worship. And that's what he wants us to do. And Sunday sacredness is part of the mark of his authority. It's a mark of rebellion. With due respect to my fellow Christians. Sabbath is established by God, the creator of heaven and earth, as a sign that he owns here. But yet, Satan wants to overthrow God and overthrow God's authority in this world by overthrowing his Sabbath. And some of you might be wondering, how now can Sunday sacredness be the mark of the beast? Because it is not yet implemented. So the mark of the beast is not yet implemented. It is not yet enforced. But there is evidence to suggest that the possibility exists for this to happen. Because in the 1800s, a group of Protestant denominations made a move in the US, United States Congress to not only pass a law for Sunday to be observed, not only by the church, but by the, by the state, because they wanted America to be, a Christ, to be declared a Christian nation. And so they wanted to enforce Sunday as a rest day, as a Sabbath, and they wanted to be in the Constitution. But the senator, and the senator at the time, would not have it because the Constitution says that Congress shall make no law respecting the religious views of any particular individual. But there is evidence again to suggest that um, they will undermine the Constitution and allow this law to be passed, referred to as the blue laws. If you're hearing this message for the first time, you can do the research. Go on Wikipedia and type in blue laws and you will understand what I'm talking about. So the point I'm trying to make, brothers and sisters, is that to understand the mark of the beast, you have to do some Bible study. <laughs> you have to do some Bible study. Don't just come up with some creative ways of, of trying to invent ideas and wonder what's happening. And, 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 and this Bible study should not lead us, brothers and sisters, to become paranoid about the government. Let me, let me make that clear before I close. Our understanding of the mark of the beast should not lead us to become paranoid about the government. We must respect the authority of the government and listen to what they have to say unless what they say conflict with what the Bible says. And right now, some of us are making a halabu about the COVID vaccine, which is not warranted because I don't see any scripture telling me that COVID-19 is a mark of the beast. What I should protest against is any move to take away my right to worship God. That's what I must protest against. But let's not um, appear to be ignorant of these things. Study the word of God for yourself and know it. So we say that the mark of the beast also must be a moral issue. We said that in order for us to understand the mark of the beast, we need to know who the beast is. And we have already identified the beast, the first beast and the second beast, and we know what to look forward to. The final point I'll make, brothers and sisters, is to, is to remind us that this prophecy is yet future. And when a prophecy is in the future, we still need to be humble about the conclusions we make. Because sometimes the prophecy may not go exactly as a we think we plan it out but what we can do is that we can do a study like what i did with you this evening and we can come to conclusions about who the beast is and about and so on but we have to be careful about how we try to pin down how this will all play out because the prophecy is still yet future what we need to do right now is to make sure that we are among those who are called saints who keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus, and have the faith of Jesus Christ.